Now you now that you know what sociology is, how did sociology come about? Sociology, the study of sociology began in the late 19th century, so it's really only a little more than 100 years old, and there were two major world events that really set the science of sociology ahead. And those two world events were the French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution, two things that happened in Europe. So sociology ultimately begins in Europe. In the French Revolution, there was a radical change overthrowing monarchy, and there's a shift in social thinking. It's also influenced a lot by the ideas of the Enlightenment, the idea that all men are born free and equal. And the Industrial Revolution also had a, caused a major shift in society. People moved from farm life to factory life, and with that came a loss in the sense of community and place and people standing in life. And those ideological and social changes ultimately lead to the science of sociology. And the first person uh, to really understand the science or to create the science, the person who's credited with it, is Auguste Comte, who is French, and he's considered the father of sociology. And some of his ideas are still held today. Um, he believed that if societies were to advance, social behavior had to be studied scientifically. And because no science of society existed, he created sociology, and he actually coined the term to describe this new science. He had a couple different concepts that he wrote about. Uh, the first was positivism. And this was the idea that we should use observation to study social behavior, and that sociology should be a science that's based on knowledge of which we can be positive or of which we can be sure. And that's why he wanted to put an emphasis on observable behaviors. And he believed that there were two basic distinctions in the study of sociology that were at the, that are still at the center of modern sociology. And those two ideas were social statics and social dynamics. And social statics was basically the study of social stability and order. What are the things that keep society together? And then social dynamics were the things that cause change, or the study of social change in society. And he believed that sociology should use scientific procedures to promote social progress. And this was widely adopted by other European scholars. The first of which was Harriet Martineau, who was English despite her French name. She was a middle-class British woman. Uh, she was a writer, and she actually started writing after her family's textile mill went out of business during a depression and after a failed engagement that she had. Uh, first, she was trying just trying to create income, uh, but eventually she became a pretty popular writer and even outsold Charles Dickens in her day. But she's best known for translating Auguste Comte's book. Um, she also, though, did make original contributions in areas of research methods, political economy, and feminist theory. Her own book, which was called Society in America, uh, she drew a link between slavery and the oppression of women. Uh, she was both a supporter of emancipation or freeing of women and slaves, and ultimately concluded that women's lack of economic power helped to keep them dependent on men. And a lot of her work inspires future feminist theorists. Herbert Spencer was also an Englishman. Um, he was exclusively taught by his father and uncle, um, but really disliked scholarly work, so he didn't end up going off to college. Um, he basically did his own higher education by doing his own readings. And because of that, he kind of uh, became a jack of all trades, uh, working in engineering, drafting, inventing journalism, writing. And he goes off the ideas of comps and, and really looks at social stability. And to explain social stability, Spencer compared society to the human body. He said, like a body, a society is composed of parts that work together to promote its well-being and survival. So people have brains, stomachs, nervous system, limbs, all of these things work together to promote the well-being of the human. And just like that, societies have economies, religions, governments, and families to keep it working in order. Spencer's 
biggest idea or uh, biggest significance to the field of sociology was his theory of social Darwinism, which was a theory of social change. And he based this theory off of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. And he basically said that evolutionary social change ultimately leads to progress and people should not interfere, that a natural social selection would ensure the survival of the fittest society. He actually opposed social reform because he interfered with this natural social selection process. And with this idea comes the the conclusions that the poor deserve to be poor and the rich deserve to be rich, that society will profit from allowing individuals to work for their social mobility without any help or hindrance. And so with that, he didn't think that anybody should interfere with poverty and interfering with something like that would be actually be harmful to society. Uh, This theory is actually widely accepted by business interests in the U.S. in the late 1800s, an era that we call the Gilded Age, because it ultimately gave these businessmen a moral basis for their competitive or cutthroat actions. Um, But the turn of the 20th century, uh, public support for government intervention increased and Darwin, social Darwinism actually slips out of fashion. Karl Marx is another really interesting person who had some far reaching ideas. Um, He actually didn't consider himself a sociologist, but his ideas had a, a pretty major impact in sociology and even in political science. Um, he had a lot of concern about the poverty and inequality that was suffered by the working class as a result of the Industrial Revolution. And he thought that life was guided by the principle that social scientists should actually try to change the world rather than just try to study it. And with his work, he actually identified several social classes that existed in the 19th century industrial society and predicted that at some point all industrial societies would only have two social classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. The bourgeoisie was the group that owned the means for producing wealth, so the owners of the factories, the owners of the factory equipment, other things that are known as capital. So he also called the bourgeoisie capitalists. And he said the proletariat is the group of workers. They work for the bourgeoisie, and ultimately the bourgeoisie only pays them enough to stay alive. And he says that the key to unfolding history is a a class conflict that's going to happen between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. He said that this is inevitable, that the bourgeoisie and the proletariat would clash, just as slaves overthrew slave owners, wage workers would overthrow the capitalists. And out of this conflict would would be a classless society or a communist society, as he understood it, one in which there would be no powerless proletariat and no powerful capitalists. Everybody would ultimately be treated the same. Now, he also he also advocated for planned revolution to speed up this change, that it would ultimately happen over time, but if revolution was planned, it would speed that social change up. Uh, his political objective certainly was to explain the workings of capitalism and to speed up its fall, but ultimately he believed that capitalism would eventually self-destruct all on its own. Emil Durkheim uh, was another sociologist, and he believed that society exists because of a broad agreement between its members. And he said that there's two different types of agreements, mechanical solidarity and organic solidarity. He says that mechanical solidarity is a type of agreement that only exists in pre-industrial time. And that's when there's a widespread consensus of values and beliefs and strong social pressures for conformity, as well as dependence on tradition and family. And as societies become more industrialized, they shift to organic solidarity, where there's a social interdependency based on a web of specialized roles. These roles that make members of a society dependent on one another for goods and services. So instead of becoming self-sufficient, people actually need, for example, bankers and bankers need customers. They're, They're interdependent upon one another. Early sociologists emphasized the need to make sociology scientific, 
uh, but they didn't have the research tools that are available today. But Durkheim and later sociologists actually used data collection and classification to test their social theories and actually used statistical techniques in his groundbreaking research on suicide. And in that study, he demonstrated that suicide involves more than individuals acting alone and that suicide rates vary according to group characteristics. Another important sociologist was Max Weber. Max Weber was another German. Um, and through the quality of his work and the diversity of his interests, Weber actually has had the single most important influence on the development of sociological theory. And within his theory, he says that human beings act on the basis of their own understanding of a situation. And sociologists have to discover what the personal meanings, values, beliefs, and attitudes are that underlie all human social behavior. And he believed that an, an understanding of the personal intentions of people in groups can best be accomplished through a, a concept that he called Verstehen. And Verstehen was just the understanding of the social behavior of others by putting yourself mentally in their place or putting yourself in someone else's shoes and doing that allows you to shed your values and see things from a different point of view. There were also a number of early sociologists that were in the United States. Something that uh, was different about U.S. sociologists versus European sociologists is that a lot of times you, sociolog early sociologists in the United States were often associated with social work or advocating for social change rather than working um, at universities and teaching sociology. Jane Addams grew up in Chicago and as she was growing up she saw many examples of government corruption and business practices that harmed workers. And throughout her life, she never forgot the suffering. And when she was on a holiday in London, she actually saw work that was being done to help the poor. And that made her decide to come back to Chicago and open up a, uh, a house called Whole House. It was basically a service that provided help to people who needed it, whether it was immigrants, people who were sick, poor, or elderly. And she really focused on the problems that were caused by an imbalance of power among the social classes. She actually invited sociologists from the University of Chicago to Whole House to witness the effects of industrialism firsthand on the lower classes. She was also very active in women's suffrage and peace movements and was the first sociologist to receive the Nobel Peace Prize in 1931. The other important sociologist that was from the United States was W.E.B. Du Bois, and in his work he was an educator and an activist and really influenced the early development of sociology in the United States. And most of his work focused on the racial issues that he understood from his own experiences living and working in the South. And I believe that the racist policies of the United States were based on an assumption that African Americans were an inferior race, and to that end, analyzed the social structure of African American communities. He was also active in the Pan-Africa movement, was concerned with the rights of all African descendants, no matter where they lived.